you know, I was working on my Fortran compiler and she saw this game on a teletype and she said, well, you know, why couldn't we do something um, on a computer? I had no choice. I had a I had a five year old and a and a baby, and I and Ken was working. He had a couple of jobs. She um, didn't tell me what she was doing. She kind of um, specked out a uh, computer game, and uh, drew pictures to go with it, and um, planned a dinner at a restaurant, kind of a steak place or something. I remember, and we went to dinner, and uh, she kind of sprung it on me. Her whole idea for a game called uh, Mystery House and what it would be and how it would work and asked me if I could program it. The first game just, I just did it because I, I had to, I just did it. I don't know, it was, I was compelled to. I remember sitting in a restaurant and she's describing the plot of the game and the, um, kind of loosely like the old, uh, there was a movie called uh, House on Haunted Hill or something like that where uh, 10 people are in a house and one by one they get killed and they're all kind of locked in the house. And um, she kind of loosely based it on that and she said, uh, could you program something like that that's kind of like these adventure games I've been playing but with graphics. When I did Mystery House, I didn't do it for any reason other than to do it. I just wanted to do it. And um, was actually re re relatively surprised it, it did as well as it did and it started a company. She drew pencil sketches and then one of the problems was how are you going to get the pencil sketches into the computer. I went to the computer store to see if there was anything that could help. Somebody had, well first off, I mean there was no such thing as scanners or any of that kind of stuff in the day and there was no way to uh, put a picture like straight into a computer. No one had done that yet and even if you did, which nobody would have done, uh, with an, only an 80K floppy drive, I mean, she wanted something with 100 pictures. And so I said, well, maybe I could trace the pictures by doing endpoints for lines. And I did uh, some simple routines to draw uh, like a house formed out of squares using endpoints of lines to get kind of a vectored drawing. And I said, well, you know, if I do this house out of vectors, I can fit um, an entire picture on a disk. And just by having, you know, like, the line starts here, goes there, goes there, goes there, goes there, and you only used eight bytes or 20 bytes or something. And, um, but that's pretty tedious to have to uh, map all that out. So I remember getting uh, uh, plain old graph paper and giving her something with uh, squares and saying, draw on this, and then um, I can count the squares and figure out uh, how to uh, digitize it. And I was at a computer store and saw kind of a, uh, it was called a Versa Writer, I think was what it was called. Somebody had taken a tablet with um, two arms on it and two rheostats so that, um, and plugged it into the joystick port on a Apple II. And it was just two arms with a, a rheostat here and a rheostat there. And uh, basically you could move it to a point and then um, get an XY coordinate. We were able to take one of her drawings, which she had done in graph paper, put it onto this tablet, go to this corner, and then press a button, and it would say, oh yeah, you're at 20 comma 35. Then you'd go over here, and the two arms would literally hinge out, and then we'd click the button, and we'd say, okay, you're there now, and then you go to the new point. And so you could digitize a whole picture in 15 minutes or something if it was, you know, 30, 40 points. You'd go click, 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 click. The Apple II was so slow in those days when I would, um, draw back a picture, you could see the lines draw. And so uh, you could see which order we digitized the points in on the uh, Versa Writer. But I could uh, fit you know, 80, 90 pictures plus some text on a um, 80K floppy drive. I mean, today 80K is considered um, a thumbnail. Mystery House was all black and white. And we got Mystery House out there. Yeah, Roberta played the game. That was kind of, I guess you'd call it QA. She kind of specced it out. Already I was thinking, well, this would be cool if we do it. I want to do lots of games. We had a spreadsheet that said, uh, these are the locations. And then another spreadsheet that said, these are the verb and noun combinations. Another one that says, these are the messages that could be issued. And then another spreadsheet that kind of said, these are the um, uh, conditional tests, like, you know, if you have the ax and there's a door and you say open door and you have the ax, you can beat it down or something. And um, so I, I focused on developing the, um, the language. 
uh, defining it and defining these series of spreadsheets. And then Roberta um, basically kind of played filled in the blanks on the spreadsheet and drew the pictures. And it came together quick. I mean, I, I'd be surprised if it was more than two or three months to uh, get the game done. Christmas of 79, because I think the Apple II was somewhat a Christmas present for me. And um, so we got the Apple II and um, almost immediately started programming the game. And it probably came out in like January of 1980. And uh, that's why sometimes we say we started the company in 79 and sometimes 80 because we started programming and building in 79. But I think it was like the end of 79 and then we released the game probably by February of 1980. I remember there was a guy, I don't even remember how I met him, Keith Wilde, who I think was a programmer I had worked with, who said uh, maybe I could do a game for the Apple. And um, he programmed a simplistic game, I think just called Skeet Shoot, where um, uh, there would be um, you know, a little animated skeet and a little gun at the bottom of the screen that would shoot at it. And he said, do you think you could sell this? And um, so I said, sure. And I started selling his game. So now I suddenly have Mystery House and Skeet Shoot. Well, yeah, the name was because of my specialty. I, was, um, I had a consulting business and I needed a DBA because I was doing, uh, doing business as, because I was doing work for... Um, lots of big companies in the LA area um, specializing in um, communications or network type applications. And in those days we would say, you know, an online application. So I called my company uh, Online Systems. So the first products we shipped all said Online Systems. It looked like Sierra was going to go. I um, quit all my various jobs and in May of 1980 we moved up to uh, Coarse Gold, California, which um, literally was the boondocks. I mean, we were um, an hour out of Fresno up by Yosemite and um, neat little town. And we um, bought kind of almost literally, a, in fact, I think it was a log cabin, kind of on a um, acre and a half of land. And um, from there, we were uh, producing the uh, product ourselves, hiring neighborhood kids. And I remember going to the local market with taking a shopping cart and just overflowing the thing with every Ziploc bag they had in the store. And um, going to the local print shop and printing off hundreds of copies of these. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd take a Ziploc bag, we'd take a single uh, piece of kind of um, a thick paper, print it on the front saying what it was, and we'd throw a floppy disk in the bag. And uh, that was it and we had sell them you know, wholesale. I remember I, I kind of came up with the idea of selling the product at 30% off of retail and because uh, nobody had done any of this stuff before at the time. Yeah, we had orders. I mean, we, we couldn't keep up. And so every, I mean, we were doubling like every month. I mean, it was incredible. Probably by late 1980, we had moved to a um, office in town so it was really only five or six months when we were out of our house. The early product all had our uh, home phone on it because it never occurred to us that um, we'd sell enough copies that there could be a problem for people to call. But when you're selling adventure games, people get um, stuck and they need a hint. So we'd get calls at four in the morning or something from another country and somebody would uh, say, you know, in their broken English, um, you know, how do you open the door or how do you get the key? And, um, and, and we were happy to get the calls. I mean, in those days, we just thought it was great. But then it kind of got bigger. So yeah, it was probably from um, idea to going through moving, quitting jobs, uh, selling the house, buying a house in Oakhurst. I don't think it was more than six months. I never had to seek people. Well, I grew up in Janesville, Wisconsin. I grew up in San Diego. I grew up in Visalia, California. I was born in Long Beach, California. I uh, was born in 1951, kind of as the tail end of the baby boom. Six kids in our family, mom and dad. I, I, was, I was planning to go to college for electronics engineering, and somewhere around uh, 1980, I got interested in computers and in computer games. Made it through two years of college, six months of a tech school, year and a half of working and now I am in the Air Force. I was working for the telephone company as their data processing manager so I also got involved with personal computers at that time. I was really uh, interested in the 
Atari 800 because it seemed to have a lot of capabilities that the Apple didn't have. And I grew up in Wilmington, went to high school there, um, married and moved to Huntington Beach, and then moved up to Fresno in 1973 and then on up to the mountains in 1979. Had three computer classes, kind of enjoyed it, and really wanted a computer. Now my friend and I have a TRS-80 to play with, and I was going to write a program. So what I did was, in basic language, while we were on a temporary assignment in Spain, sat and in eight hours wrote a reasonable version of a game called Lunar Lander. I have a brother who is a quadriplegic and he actually bought the computer but not being able to use his fingers um, I helped him quite a bit to to use the computer in the early part but it turned out that I'm the one that ended up using his computer more often than he, than he did at that time uh, so I ended up in, in, in helping him I ended up learning how to use that computer and programming it. Computer Fair, West Coast Computer Fair, and, and Ken Williams was there with a sign looking for programmers. And so I just stopped by, talked to him, he explained a little bit about the area he was in. I was kind of tired of the city life in San Diego, I was really looking for a change, and so everything just kind of fell into place. Ken came to the, um, the house and wanted to know if I'd be interested in doing some work for him in taking their Apple products and making them run on the Atari. And I thought, well, that sounds like fun. And started selling real estate up here and started working with Ken Williams about buying land to build his new home on and got to know him and his executive vice president that he'd brought in. And they had um, the, the salesperson at that time, um, he had met as he was trying on skis, and so they were looking for someone who was a little more accustomed to sales. Um, and so I was offered the job, and I thought, well, this will be great for the winter. It's not great selling real estate in the mountains in the winter because it's cold and it's snowy. And this was September, and I thought, well, I can learn about computers because I knew absolutely nothing about computers. It is a puzzle to program and, and, and develop games. So maybe that was a natural fit for me. Um, I got made fun of this, but I want to tell it again. Uh, when I was about four years old, my father, um, from his drop for from his laddish uh, job, he had these clickers that count cycles on the machine. So every time the machine opens, it it, it triggers a little clicker and and it counts the number of parts that somebody makes or the cycles. But you know, when those were old, he, he brought them home for me as a kid. So as a four-year-old kid, I would click that thing nonstop. Just, you know, and see the numbers, and then I'd point it at my dad and say, what, what number is this? And I must have bugged him terribly. But that thing, I think that was significant in, in what I turned into in, in really liking the program because it really ingrained in me, you know, numbers and calculations and stuff. Lunar Lander was one of the early arcade games where a lunar module was landed on the moon by you using primitive controls of thrust and rotation and equally primitive graphics. But it was captivating, like all of the early games back then. Your mind painted a, a bigger picture of the game than what actually was on the screen in front of you. With my, uh, with my experience with the TRS-80, I finally think I understood what computers could be used for and what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. My first real job is, is for Parker Penn. Um, I worked in sort of a, it wasn't the main factory, but it was, it was a fabrication. It was a specialized part of Parker Penn that did custom orders and, and unique parts. And so I ran a, a molding machine, an injection molding machine. And it was on a cycle and it made pen parts or any kind of custom order plastic parts. So the cycle lasted 20 to 30 seconds and it was a machine that had a lot of dials on it and you had to keep the, the plastic just the right temperature. Uh, back in Wisconsin there was a lot of humidity and so you had to factor the humidity in to your temperature and it was a real challenge. It was a lot of tinkering to get things just right because if, if the plastic was too hot then it 
flashed or flanged. It's been 35 years, I forget the terminology. But, you know, the pens didn't come out just right. The plastic kind of overshot the mold, and so you had to recycle them at then. But, yeah, that machine was sort of like a little computer in that you had to... You had to I had already made the decision to leave the Air Force. I was going to be effectively done with my enlistment in, in October of that year, and I was looking for work. My wife, who's also looking for work, uh, came across an ad in the LA Times with the very clever title, Boot into Yosemite. She showed me the ad, I read through it. It um, basically talked about needing to hire people for a game company to uh, write computer games. It described, I would say, the, the most unpleasant circumstances in the world that you'd be working with. It talked about the small town talked about the, the rural nature of where the company was located, but I said, hey, this is the thing to do. I'd heard of Sierra Online. I've heard of, uh, at that time, Wizard and the Princess. I had never seen it, but I knew they existed. I obviously was trying to talk people out of applying, but I applied anyway. I didn't have anything other than my, you know, my, my self-accomplishments, my... Uh, my programs that I'd written. My wife wrote a cover letter that said something along the line of this is what he wants to do with the rest of his life. Um, and I received a letter about a week after we applied for it that says, we'd like to have you come interview. I uh, had, had what turned out to be one of the last interviews of the day. And in fact, when I arrived in the room on time, they were already starting to pack up. And I kind of wondered after this six hour trip from where I was to get to the interview whether it all had been in vain. But I was ushered into a room with, uh, with one other applicant sitting on the couch and I was handed a piece of paper and said, please fill this out. And it was a very cursory sort of interview question programming test. And I wrote down some of my best fragments of assembly language programming that I knew. And I was then told to sit and wait a little while. About 15 minutes later, I was taken into a room with Ken Williams. It's the first time that I believe I'd ever heard his name because I only knew of Sierra Online as a company. And I certainly had never seen him before. And there, sitting comfortably in a chair, hunched over a pile of papers with hopefully mine in his hand, was this not intimidating, but person who you realized was was somebody already. But he convinced me and it was a large leap of faith, but he caught me at just the right moment in my life because I was kind of in a transition where I needed to do something different. Um, I just, uh, it, my mom had just died, so I was kind of down over that. I was taking care of my brother, the quadriplegic, um, and we ended up in a big argument. And because I, and I told him, I'm moving to California. <laughs> Actually, I, to tell it right, he, we had the argument first, and that was just after I'd talked to Ken Williams. And Ken tried to convince me, and I was waffling. I didn't, really didn't know. But, but that big argument we had just made me so mad, I just blurted out, I'm moving to California. Right? And he goes, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> but a couple weeks later, I was here. He said to me something along the line of, so you want to be a programmer? And I said, more than anything that I can think of. And he says, well, I, I like what you've got here. I like your answers. Can you tell me what this is? And he asked for a little clarification on some of my penmanship, probably. And I explained what I was doing. He says, OK. And then he turned to me and he said, you know, we almost didn't have you in for an interview. You were in the stack of no's when we took one last look through. And you need to thank your wife for that cover letter she wrote, because that's what got you this interview. And my wife tells that story more than I do to this day, because she'd like to take a little bit of credit for getting me the job in the first place. And I ended up staying then in the computer industry until year 2000, and actually with Sierra for two years, and then moving on into distribution and other software companies. Ken and I had a, a certain respect for each other, I believe, and, and we both always stood up for what we believe in, and, and that's not um, 
sometimes when you dealt with Ken, um, you know, if you didn't stand up for what you believe in, then he would take advantage of that. So as long as he knew where you stand and you knew where he stood, uh, it worked out pretty good. And Ken and I worked together pretty early on. I mean, this was before he hired any other programmers. So I was the first one he hired as a programmer. So we worked together actually coding, which I don't think he's done that with too many people. I think it was after we had had the, um, the, the Pac-Man project and, and the whole bit about how it was too close to Pac-Man. I named John Harris, who had done it, and it, it just was beautiful. It was just really well done. And so we didn't really want to stop selling it. And um, so I did some reading on um, copyright law and uh, built a pretty solid understanding of copyright law. It was my opinion that um, the idea behind a game and the strategies and stuff fall into patent law and the physical characters and sound effects and music fall into copyright law. A whole bit about how it was too close to Pac-Man and you know, we can't sell things like that because they're enforcing copyright. As kind of a um, pushback at Atari, when we were told to take it off the market, I, I, I told John to um, swap the characters and don't use little ghosts and don't use um, you know, dots in a maze. He had asked me at one point to disguise the game. Atari under copyright law kind of owned that maze and those particular characters, but if we were to swap it. And so I took it home and, and brought it back with mustaches and sunglasses and all the characters the next day. And I don't remember who came up with the idea of calling it uh, Jawbreaker. Kent, yes, and, and you know, fun, but obviously not quite what, what he had intended. And so we redid the game, we put a new theme on it, but, uh, but wound up getting sued by Atari anyway. It was really just kind of almost a tribute, you know, or, or, you know by allowing people to play it on their personal computer. I, I don't remember when we did Pac-Man thinking, you know, I should be licensing this and paying people. It didn't occur to me. Because it still played that kind of maze game. So we published it, and it was kind of a big hit. And um, then somehow we got approached by, I guess it was Atari, yeah, it was Atari, saying stop selling Pac-Man. I did. I was certainly one of the one of the main witnesses, and and um, that was a, that was a crazy time too. Although I thought I thought we handled it. Ken in particular handled it really well to try to keep things light. I don't remember ever being frightened because the worst that was going to happen was they were going to make us take it off the market. They could theoretically ask for all the money back, but we had a good enough ar argument. I wasn't. Um, worried that was going to occur. You know, he made up t-shirts that said, pack who? Yeah, yeah it was interesting. It, it was a fun time. And uh, just tried to kind of downplay the seriousness of everything that was going on. And I think that helped a lot. Uh, when we won the first lawsuit, we had uh, uh, online one Atari Zero t-shirts made. 